Namaste and welcome to Pods by PEI, a policy discussion series brought to you by Policy Entrepreneurs Inc. My name is Shreya Rana. In today's episode, PEI colleague Anuj Tiwari is joined by Jeevan Banya for conversation on unveiling Korea, the truth behind access and affordability of Nepali workers. Jeevan is the Assistant Director of the Center for the Study of Labor and Mobility at Social Science Baha. He has provided advisory and technical support to multiple national and international organizations, including the Ministry for Labor, Employment and Social Security, the National Human Rights Commission Nepal, the ILO, trade unions and CSOs. The two draw from Jeevan's recent paper titled Only a Few Can Afford to Go to Korea, The Costs of Nepali Migration to South Korea to explore the pre-migration phase of the Nepal-Korea migration, to explore the unique characteristics of migration to Korea from the perspective of aspirations and capabilities to understand the immigrants, their motivation to move and avenues to facilitate the movement along with problems and vulnerabilities that arise. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Welcome to Pods by PEI, Zivan. I appreciate you taking the time to join us. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me here. Great. Shall we start then? Yes, please. We're here to talk about a paper you published a little more than a month ago titled Only a Few Can Afford to Go to Korea, The Costs of Nepali Migration to South Korea. In the paper, you've highlighted interesting findings, especially on the pre-migration phase of Nepal-Korea Migration Corridor. The article presents the first phase of findings within the larger research project, Migrating to South Korea for Employment, Experience, Aspiration, and Perception of Nepali Youths. And we can presume by the end of this project, you'll have answered other pertinent questions related to Korea migration. But before we get into the paper itself, let's begin with a brief background on the Nepal-Korea Migration Corridor and its distinct characteristics. Perhaps you could start by giving the listeners a brief history of the Nepal-Korea Migration Corridor and how it became one of the most sought after destination countries amongst Nepali migrant workers. Sure, first of all, thank you very much for reading the paper that we published. If you've already read through the, uh, the paper, in the paper, we've mentioned that we don't have accurate record about when the migration from Nepal to South Korea began. However, one of the official sources of South Korea suggests that there were a substantial number of Nepalese even before 1992. Because in 1992, Korea provided some kind of amnesty to the migrant workers according to which Nepali migrant workers could apply for the amnesty. So in that year, the total number of Nepali migrant workers who applied for the amnesty was slightly above 5,000. So that suggests that the migration started even before uh, early 1990s. Maybe it can be attributed to the economic development and industrial development that Korea had experienced, particularly after 1961. But in terms of you know, regulations and immigration policies and things like that, we can expect that that might have started after the Korea became a democratic country in 80s. And you know, if you look at the policy framework of South Korea, it was in early 1990s that they introduced this technical training program for the migrant workers. They wanted to bring migrant workers from abroad in order to address the labor shortages that they had experienced in their labor markets, as well as the rising cost for the for hiring the laborers within the country. Hence, they decided that they, they have to bring migrant workers from abroad. However, in the 1990s, since Korea was also a democratic country and there were concerns from international community, migrant communities, trade unions, human rights activists within South Korea, and they were concerned about the exploitation, human rights violations, and undermining of various labor rights, lack of social protections, and things like that. So Korea came under some kind of pressure. Hence, it realized that the policies need to be revised. And then it was in 2007 that they introduced what we now call the employment permit system. So before that, it was sort of part-time, sort of precarious employment for the trainees. But with the introduction of EPS, it regularized the system. It defines the regulatory framework. 
and then recruitment process and things like that. Nepal also signed a memorandum of understanding with the Republic of Korea or South Korea in 2007, and then Nepal started sending migrant workers under EPS through the formal channel. And the number was very low in the beginning but it has increased over the time. So according to the EPS system, they bring migrant workers from 16 different countries. Initially it was 15, but later on one country was added. So now there are 16 countries from where the migrant workers migrate to South Korea under this EPS system. So Nepal is obviously one of them. And then the South Korean government every year, it it announces the quotas for these countries. So under that quota, the hiring process, let's say, or even after the hiring process under the EPS system, as you might have noticed, aspirant migrant workers need to meet two major criteria. One of them is the language test, Korean language test, what they call this topic test proficiency in Korean language. And the next one that was added later is the skill test. One needs to meet these criteria before even to be considered for eligible list. So here, even if one passes the, these tests and then are enlisted in the, in the roster uh, as potentially eligible employee, they, they may not end up getting into Korea. So we, we need to make a note of it. But here, what I'm trying to say is that there is the increasing demand in South Korea because of its blue growing economy. It's basically the manufacturer sectors that ne- Nepalese migrated in the beginning, but gradually they, they moved to agriculture sector as well. So it's around 80 to 20, 80 in uh, manufacturing sector to agriculture sector. But if you have followed recent news that there is also demand in the shipbuilding recently. So in the beginning, it, the quota used to be around 5,000 to 7,000 in 2008, 9, 10, but gradually there has been increased demand. and. Every year, around 7,000 migrant workers migrate to South Korea under the employment system. The Korean government has promised or expressed interest to hire around 40,000 migrant workers this and next year. So that means that there is a great interest and demand from the Korean side. One of the reasons why they prefer Nepali migrant workers could be because Nepali migrant workers are considered to be honest trustworthy and hardworking. And it's also, I've lived in South Korea for almost four years. So this is also my personal experience that the Nepalese, they learn the Korean language faster because we have similar sentence structure. So for us, it's much more easier to learn the language. So once you learn these soft skills, you have better communications and you enhance your skills. So within the workspace also, you enhance the skills and that's where they find Nepali migrant workers quite productive. Hence, the demand has grown over the over the time, and maybe the Nepalese have also benefited out of these these experience. So, as you mentioned in the very outset, that South Korea has been one of the major attractive destinations for the Nepali migrant workers. It's been like that for almost two decades now. Now, according to the Korean official account, currently there are more than 37,000 Nepalese working in Korea. And from these kind of migration, the country has also benefited in terms of remittance. So the remittance that Nepal receives from South Korea constitutes almost 2% of the total remittance that the Nepal receives. However, this is just the, according to the official account, as you know that the, uh, South Korea is one of the major countries from where Nepalese receive remittance informally, which is known as Hundi as well. In the recent year, there has been some changes in terms of how the uh, remittance has been sent to Nepal because the remittance service providers have facilitated the process a lot. And the banks are also quite engaged in this, but still people tend to use Hundi for various reasons. One of one of the reasons is that there are a significant number of migrant workers who are staying informally, illegally, undocumented. And then they also find it easier, faster to send the, the money. Hence, but anyway, the remittance is quite quite important. The remittance that we receive is also quite substantial, I would I would say. And uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, the experience, there are these positive aspects. However, maybe we can discuss about it later on, but there are also the other issues about the cost, social cost and things like that.
That was excellent opening. The Nepal-Korea Migration Corridor is definitely peculiar. And with that, I think we are ready to dive into your research. As I mentioned before, this article is only the first phase of a more extensive research project. Can you il illustrate the full scope of your study and tell us the significance of this particular topic? Maybe you can also add, how are you undertaking it? Sure. So one of the objectives of this research was defined after the review of literature we normally do for other research as well. And then we found that most of the research that's done in Nepal and about Nepal or Nepali migrant workers are about those going to the GCC and Malaysia. And a few studies done for Nepalese going to India. And we also did some review about Nepalese going to South Korea under the EPS. And what our study suggested was that those studies were either focused on, let's say, one aspect of um, uh, these migrant workers, for example, the marriage, marriage migration. And uh, some of the research have touched upon their living and working conditions. Some of them touch upon uh, the situation of their labor rights uh, protections. And some study also focus on their experience about integration in the Korean society, how they've been uh, assimilated or a culture in Korean um, society. However, given that, as I mentioned earlier, it's been almost more than 16 years that Nep Nepalese have been to South Korea under EP. And we, we don't have that much of a research about these uh, migrant workers, about the process that the Nepalese take, about these uh, requirements that they, they need to, um, uh, to meet, and how do they finance their migration, what kind of skills they migrate, and what socioeconomic background that they hail from, and things like that. So we were interested in, in these kind of questions. And we are also interested to other aspects, such as as you might have noticed that Korea is one of the countries from where we have higher rates of uh, suicides. So why this suicide is happening, despite the fact that they have higher salaries, you know, better labor rights and things like that, why it is happening. So we were interested in these questions. We are also interested in undertaking this larger study, also because you know the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, it's about 5,000 to 7,000. The, the last year, it has been above 12,000 that Nepalese have actually been to uh, South Korea, but the average has been around 7,000 each year. However, we have more than 90,000 aspirant migrant workers who apply for topic test. That's just for the exam. Forget about those who prepare for this test but do not actually take test. So how do we how do we evaluate this cost? Cost about the time. For example, it takes about, I mean, they spent about six months to prepare the test. And in our studies, I think more than 50% take these tests more than twice. And only few of them actually end up being in South Korea. So what happens to those who can't eventually make it to South Korea under this system? What happens to them? What about the investment that they make? So we are interested to also learn about these things. And we also wanted to look at what happens to the migrant workers who have actually been to South Korea and what happens to them and their family. Hence, was Center for the Study of Labor and Mobility, SESLAM at Social Science Baha, where I'm based at. We conducted the first phase of study in May, mid-2018, and then we were planning to conduct the end line, or we wanted to follow these migrant workers and their families in destination countries and here in Nepal. But because of the COVID situation, well, we haven't managed to do the field work. We've almost finalized the, the methodology and instruments, but we haven't yet hit the ground for the study. So that's where we are in terms of the progress in the larger study. So in that study, we conducted 402 surveys with the aspirant migrant workers who were enrolled in 16 Korean language training institutions 
in Kathmandu Valley, Bhaktapur, Lalitpur, and Kathmandu. And we also conducted some semi-structured interviews with these trainees and key informant interviews with the stakeholders working in this area. So the report that you mentioned in the beginning is based on findings from the first phase of study. What is interesting to note here in terms of our experience in conducting this research is that when we try to map these language institutes who provide these services, and then we try to find the contact number and address, but most of the contact address and the numbers were in the name of charter accountants. So it was very tricky for us to even identify the the exact number of research centers, but eventually we managed to compile more than 6,000 companies who were registered in the company registered offices. And we try to reach out by telephone and we ask them whether they still continue to provide these services. And we ask them whether they would like to participate or not. And then those who express their, their interest, we also ask their permission, their facilitation. And before and after the language classes, we, we spoke with uh, the migrant workers. What I'm, I'm trying to say here is that you know, it also gives us some food for thought in terms of how migration to South Korea is governed, uh, whether or what kind of legal purview that they fall under and how the institutions are governed, because they're somehow related to the issue of labor migration. Right. Perhaps we can we can talk about that more on policy implication part later on. Sure. So your paper is built around the concept put forth by DHAS, where migration is conceptualized as a function of people's capabilities and aspirations to migrate within given sets of perceived geographical opportunity structures. He distinguishes aspirations to migrate into two dimensions, instrumental aspirations of achieving socioeconomic gains in the form of better income and health care, and intrinsic aspiration in the form of an individual's desire to improve social status or recognition that comes from being able to earn and provide for the family. In the interest of our audience's knowledge, could you please elaborate on these concepts and how your paper operationalizes them? Okay, yeah, as you might have also noticed in our paper, the D has a concept somehow helps us to answer, I mean, or frame some of the research questions and the tools and the approaches. Hence, we just uh, relied on the concept that he has defined. So as, as he rightly mentions, particularly in order to address two questions, who migrates and why people migrate to South Korea, hence, hence we drew on, on his concept. So he talks about the capabilities of the family and the individuals, be it be personal, be it be financial, or social as well. Maybe we can talk about it later, but the, the, the studies on migration also suggest that it's a personal and social network also facilitates or influences the decision of the migrant workers. But there are other aspirations of people as well, aspirations for better incomes, aspiration for a better education for the children, health, and things like that. And maybe as many studies suggest also in terms of Korea, it's also relevant because we are also influenced by the Korean culture and the way of life and through the movies and dramas and things like that. And people have some kind of fantasy or personal interest to go to these countries as well. So I think we also try to explore these drivers. And then the other aspect that he looks into is this, this structure that is available because of geography or otherwise economic structures and things like that because the kind of economic situations that a country has a society has or the pull factor for the openings and opportunities in the destination countries also play important roles so in order to frame our research questions and tools we found this concept quite quite useful hence so as we talk about aspirations and capabilities I'm curious to know how these aspects translate in other migration corridors, especially in the Gulf and Malaysia, as most Nepali migrants go there. Right. I think it does, because in our previous studies also, many of these aspirations and drivers are very relevant, we found. But in addition to that, I think we need to be cautious as to maybe the, whatever he's stated are relevant in some contexts, but not in all the contexts. So one cannot generalize on that because, and then the second one is 
we can't really be sure about which factor is more detrimental than others. For example, let's take the example of Nepal India migration. So in order to in order to discuss this in reference to his point about people's migration because of the aspiration for better social prestige, re- it's very important we all acknowledge that if we have a, a migrant going to so-called developed countries, irrespective of whether they make money or not or whether their life eventually is better or not, we are our parents, our families are quite proud of that. Right, we believe in that society. That also plays an important role because the earning and that you make also contributes to improving the social prestige, which is true. But does it apply in the case of Nepal India migration? Is something that is difficult to say because there are other reasons why people migrate. Because if you look at the particular groups of migrant workers going to India, maybe the reasons are different. And uh, but most of the uh, the elements that he touches upon are applicable, and I think he's also based on the research findings so far. So they're quite useful uh, useful points, I would say. Those are some fascinating observations, Jeevan. Now let's take the conversation forward by discussing the findings of this paper. A discovery that really intrigued me was that the most aspirants are young single males of certain caste and ethnicities. Can you describe this group and say why do you think we are seeing this trend? Yes, it's very interesting in terms of caste, I would say that I would come come to that later. First, the age. I think age and the domination of males in terms of migration to Korea also corresponds to the national patterns and trends. It's mostly the men's, and if you look at the ratio, it's the young population who migrate generally. And it's also the unemployed ones, the youth in that category from, let's say, in our sample size, we have 18 to 27 mostly, but in our context, up to 35 is the age group that they migrate the most. And these are the groups according to even the latest labor force survey, 17, 18. It also suggests that that these groups are unemployed ones. Hence, it's useful to say that they are more likely to migrate. However, these are not the only reasons because like in many other cases, it's the policy frameworks that also shapes these results, right? In terms of Korea, Korea receives youth aged between 18 to 39 that they are eligible to apply for the EPS. So... You know, I think quite natural to note that these group of people migrate in terms of age and the male domination. Caste is interesting here, I would say. Hill caste and high caste have migrated. And we don't have uh, very solid uh, findings. We didn't because we didn't probe and made that kind of analysis because uh, we are always limited by the sample size, you know, and the access to data and things like that. Perhaps if the EPS system of government of Nepal had categorized these data according to caste, ethnicity, reasons and things like that, that would have provided better nuances about about, uh, these. But in our experience and in according to some of the interviews with these institutions and the migrant workers we can maybe refer to two important aspects of it first accessibility to the language institutions is quite important because as you can imagine that most of these institutes are based in cities mostly in Kathmandu Valley and then it's highly likely that those who are far from these places may not be aware and have access to this institution. Hence, their chances to secure this opportunity is lower. Second, obviously, as we discussed earlier, the, the family's economic sources and economic condition plays an important role because then these are the people who can afford time and resources to prepare for the test and to finance their migration and things like that. In case of Madhes, I think we can take the example of Madhes, the economic situation, because if you look at the multi-dimensional poverty index also, Madhes Pradesh 2 has the lowest indexes. And then you can imagine that their poverty situation and education situation. Because in order to take these tests, 
you have to be literate. At least you need to pass the SLC, right? So that has implications in terms of in terms of these these results that you mentioned earlier. And I think we have to also make note of the fact that sometimes these phenomena are also determined by the policy framework, as I mentioned earlier. If you look at the number of Nepali migrant workers going to South Korea, manufacturers and the agriculture. So that's where I think the females, in case of female migrant workers, they are less attractive, right? Because it requires physical labor and things like that. So maybe in case of Korea, despite the fact that it has high earning opportunities, the number of female Nepali migrant workers going to South Korea is is quite low. Coming to the the economic situation, I think one of the studies conducted by the World Bank in 2021 also suggests that the probability of migration to developed countries increases with the household wealth. So in our case also, 58% of the participants that we surveyed, they had annual family income over 9,000 US dollars. So that also suggests that, you know, they had higher chances of, um, you know, participating in this training and then securing um, jobs um, uh, to South Korea. Well, that's an interesting finding and interesting analysis. So moving on, the rhetoric of brain drain is quite popular in Nepal's political arena and government's narrative. How do you see this phenomenon translates in the case of Nepal-Korea Migration Corridor? Maybe you can begin with, if you even buy this narrative of this labor migration induced brain drain at all, what do your findings say on this? I think generally, and we have we can talk about this issue in general, and then in the case of, as you mentioned, migration to South Korea as well. Obviously, one of the findings of our research was that more than 10% were the MA graduates. And the significant number of aspirant migrants had higher education. So that suggests that despite the fact that they have this bachelor's, master's degree, they are still trying to migrate through EPS system as migrant workers, laborer. So which is quite worrisome, I would say, for the Nepal and Nepalese. It applies in the other case as well. If you look at the number of Nepali students who get this no objection certificate from Ministry of Education, I think it used to be around more than 86,000 per year who, who sought these certificates. So that also suggests that it's a sort of brain drain. Brain drain in the sense that if these, these group of people continue migrating abroad, but do not really contribute to, to Nepal's development, one could consider it as a brain drain. And Nepal could benefit from these kind of migration as well. From One way of doing that is through the remittance, for sure. But there are also social remittance that they are likely to bring. And one can also argue that, you know, brain can be channelized irrespective of where you are. Right. So it depends on the policies and the priorities, investments of the, the government. So maybe I'm quite cautious in terms of using the terminology here. But what is worrisome for me is the category of people that are migrating to South Korea that I, I mentioned earlier. But in addition to that, uh, I think there are uh, around more than 3000 students migrating to South Korea. And uh, I I don't know that. I'm not convinced, at least maybe it's my personal bias because I've been there, lived there, and I did my master's there before my PhD. But my experience is that that might have changed, okay? I need to be quite maybe also mindful of that because there has been some policy changes as well. But if you look at the culture of South Korea, people having problem because of the language, Integration and permanent settlement is something that maybe Nepalese would consider as a last resort. So I think permanent settlement is not going to be there. So I see that people would eventually come back to Nepal from South Korea. Let me also bring one of the findings of another research that Seslam had conducted with ILO, in which we are trying to look at the migration of health workers from Nepal. So basically, we're looking at aspirant migrants who are health workers, these two categories of people. 
So in our study, what, what we found was that the doctors, they want to migrate, they want to acquire some higher degree and skills and all this, and then they, most of them wanted to return. But most of the nurses, they wanted to you know, migrate uh, for good. And then we asked the reason why. But the first, the, the predominant factor was better opportunities abroad. And then they had aspirations for permanent settlement. And they also perceived the incomes to be much higher abroad. So this is worrisome in the sense that we need these human resources in Nepal. We don't meet the standards of a country to have a certain number of medical professionals and health workers in Nepal according to the WHO standards. But still, these group of people are continuing to migrate and state has made a lot of investments for them, right? But we haven't been really able to retain. Look at the labor market uh, where the, these nurses have to work, find the jobs. It's even precarious to find the job. Forget about the uh, the decent salary and working condition. So I think as we discussed earlier, the, the structural situation of Nepal, I think it, it plays as a push factor uh, for the brain drain. Moving on with your findings, other two very interesting findings are related to finances. A. Household economics is a major motivator for migration and B. The primary source of fund is family. Evidently, these two conditions contradict each other. How do you explain this conflictual existence and what inferences can be drawn from this? Yes, very interesting observations, and I'm glad that you noted that. And it's based on the findings of our survey. So we'd asked these questions differently. First, you know, we asked the reasons why they want to migrate. And as we did discuss earlier, everybody, irrespective of your economic situation, income level, wants to improve their socioeconomic condition. So 90% of the survey participants, they consider that if they migrate to South Korea, there is more likelihood, better potential for the better incomes. Hence, they wanted to migrate. And as I mentioned earlier, most of the households had better economic situation, so they could finance. So better in the sense that I think we need to compare those who are going to GCC and Malaysia or to India. So in that sense, they had a better economic situation. And I think one of the other issues that we found in that study was that they received this information about going to South Korea, working situation, wage differences, living situation, things like that, even from their friends and the social networks, friends or the neighbors, relatives that they've already been to South Korea. So they would rally these sources as well in order to finance their their migration. So if you look at the, the findings of our research, for 81% of the total the participants, it was the family who provided that, that support. So I think that might help us better understand the situation, right? And I think nobody would disagree that given the conditions here in Nepal, if they, you know, uh, are able to pass the topic test and they would encourage their children to go to South Korea, then to go to other than GCC and Malaysia. Hi there, this is Shriya Rana from Policy Entrepreneurs Inc. You have been listening to Pods by PEI. If you enjoy PEI's content and would like to hear more from our team, we have good news for you. We are thrilled to introduce you to our free newsletter services, PEI Substack of Policies and Politics. PEI Substack draws from PEI's in-house expertise and experience in policy research and reform initiatives to present thought pieces on, but not limited to, politics, policies, economics, development, energy, and climate. Subscribe now to PI Substack at policyontro.substack.com or through the link in description to receive weekly newsletters, issue coverages, event updates, and full access to our recent publications. Now let's back to the episode. I'll just pick one more findings and get your inputs on it. So in your other findings... You mentioned the crucial role of private language institutes in facilitating migration to Korea, and you've also highlighted the costs associated with it. 
do you see a possibility of minimizing the pre-departure cost? Yes, I think I would like to kindly remind you to also recall the the name of the papers that we've given. We've talked about the cost in the plural sense, not only economic sense, but in, in other kind of cost as well. So first, I would talk about the economic cost that that incurs to the aspirant migrant workers. As I mentioned earlier, one of the requirements for being eligible to go to South Korea under EPS is passing the topic in Nepal. So for that, you know, language centers here in Nepal provide language courses. They provide basic, intermediate to specialized courses. So depending on which course one takes, the cost is determined by that. However, in our study, more than 87% of the participants had taken the specialized course. Mostly that's the situation when we spoke with the directors and the employer at these language institutes as well. So if you take into account of that, it would be around 150 to maximum 1800 US dollar cost. Average would be about $200, but some of them have also incurred US dollar 1800 in order to prepare the test. Why? Because first, they have maybe taken this basic intermediate and specialized course. Second, because they have to leave their homes, stay in the cities, and they don't have any support system in the cities. So they have to take rent. They have to manage their transportations and other related costs. Hence, this cost has, has increased. And another reason why we need to also talk about the cost is that just, just before that, 97% of the total participants that we spoke to were from outside of Kathmandu Valley. So that, that tells you the cost that will incur to the aspirant migrant workers who, who would take these language courses. And the other additional cost that would incur is during the skill test. Let's forget about the fees here, because you know even to take these tests, you have to travel from and stay sometimes, and you know, so that's where another cost is not headed. And then the average period is, as I mentioned, six months for the preparation. So for those who take these tests twice, one year, the cost keeps on, on rising. This is the economic aspect of it. And then when they eventually, you know, make to the final list, then they have to maybe bear about 1,000 US dollar. In addition to that, we've also touched upon the other cost that incurs in this process, which is quite serious issue that I have been arguing in other platforms as well that the government of Nepal and the government of Korea should, I think, revisit and then make necessary changes in order to, as you mentioned earlier, how you know we can minimize the cost. So here I'm talking about other costs. These 90,000 aspirant migrant workers who prepare their language test for six months drop their college and university education, even to prepare this. Only, as I mentioned earlier, 7,000, around 7,000 eventually make to the final list, right? So the school dropout, what kind of cost it is for Nepal and Nepalese? That's one, right? Time and dropouts. Because, you know, once you lose one semester or one year, then you are not interested to continue your studies, right? And the other cost associated with this is that these 80,000 who do not pass this test, they have to be subjected to some kind of social pressure, you know, anxiety, and uh, you know, they, there is certain kind of stigma in our society that one, if they do not make it to the list, they are considered as a failed and useless, and then you are treated differently. So this stigma is also there, and the migrant workers have been going through these experiences. We are talking in this paper about not only this economic cost, there are other costs that one needs to also take into account. So uh, that's the situation in terms of the cost, and one needs to, I think, give priority to this issue. Coming to this point, we've covered quite a bit of the major findings of your paper. And in the last question, you touched upon a bit on policy implication in minimizing the pre-departure cost for the Nepal-Korea migration corridor. But to get the larger picture, 
could you elaborate on the overall outlook of Nepal's policy towards this corridor based on your findings and other research works in labor migration? Perhaps you could begin with an explainer of Korea's employment permit system with a particular focus on the roles and responsibilities of both the government and the migrant workers. Sure. I think one of the things that we have to remember is that we have this global discourse going on about how labor migration or any migration can be made, let's say, win-win situation, or it should be made, it works for everyone, right? The migrants, destination countries, and receiving countries as well. So I would say that the cost that I did discuss earlier is quite huge. So we have to be mindful and serious about minimizing those costs. For that, I would say that first, there should be a recognition of this cost from both the parties and the government of Nepal and government of South Korea. And I would say, this is my personal take, based on my experience as well, language that they learn here might not be quite useful when they go to the destination countries as well. Why don't we provide this language trainings, courses to those who finally make to the list. That's where the, the 80,000 ones do not have to go through these tests because one of the criteria could be skill, soft skill and other kind of skills that are required for these migrant workers in destination countries. So hence we have to give a second thought on, on this. And so if, and then we need to have serious discussions on these costs that I mentioned earlier. And then based on that, we have to revise the memorandum of understanding that we've signed with South Korea for, for the employment and the other policy that the Nepal government has, has followed is the free visa and free ticket. It's not free, as you know from the discussion that we are having. It's not free. And it also contradicts with the state's policy. And according to the Global Compact for Migration, which Nepal is also a party of, and the government of Nepal also aims to champion its objective on fair recruitment and ethical recruitment. Also, That also calls for the employer pay model. And still migrant workers have been paying these costs right? Economic cost and other costs. So how do we minimize that? So I think in light of this, we need to rethink, revisit the policy. The Korean government has, I think, positively supported Nepal through the new project that was signed between the government of Nepal and Korea, which is called Strengthening Stage-Wise Support System. It is to support the returnees from South Korea in enterprise development, in financial literacy, skill enhancement, and things like that. But I would say that those support, based on our experience, those support needs to be tailored to the needy ones. What do I mean by needy ones here? Those who have lost their lives. What about their family, their dependents? They are the ones who are the most needy ones, right? Those who maybe have failed or have some serious health issues, right? And maybe for those failed migrant workers, for various reasons, who had to return to Nepal. So it needs to be tailored to the needs of this group of people. Um, well, despite many positives as well as few negatives, the recent controversy on the re-entry of returnees from Korea is rather concerning. As you mentioned in your previous response about the reintegration facilitated or let's say supported by Korean government is there, but what about the re-entry of re returnees from Korea? Could you please elaborate on this and how can this be resolved amicably? Yes, I think you rightly touched upon this concerning issue that Nepalese face. One of the reasons why we have this issue was also because of the COVID situation, because for a long time, Korean government did not open up the entry of the migrant workers, and hence, I think they were prohibited to return to South Korea, according to the EPS policy. If after the migrant workers complete four years and 10 months of their first employment, they can return to Nepal and they are considered as what they call the committed workers. So they can return to South Korea. Initially, it was three months, but now I think it's just after one month they can return. But there are some, some requirements as well. For example, if you want to return to the same employer, that's fine maybe, but the policy is such that if you want to migrate to another employer or the previous employer do not want to hire you, continue you, then you need to find another employer. 
So you need to find the employer yourself. So that also takes some time to process. However, for me, it's my personal observation and feeling that the Korean government in Korea, Korean government, employers association and trade unions are entering into these discussions and the policy policy discussion, according to which the trade unions want to provide rights to the migrant workers to change their employer, where the employers, for obvious reasons, are quite reluctant to agree on these. So they want to agree on terms and conditions after how many years or so, whereas from the human rights perspective, you know, it's a migrant's rights to change the employer if they think that the working condition is not good, payment is not good, employer is not good, where such situation is not, and, and so on and so forth. Hence, you know, because of these policy discussions going on, perhaps that might have implicated the entry of returnees. But gradually, according to the official account of South Korea, number of re-entries has also increased. So maybe it will take some time. But I think it would be appropriate if this kind of information could be vindicated from the formal sources rather than I speaking. As we near the end of this episode, I'd like to take a few moments to get your thoughts on the developing themes in labor migration research. Maybe you could talk about your current research projects and share some interesting things you've found. So, as we mentioned, we still have the second phase of study that we need to finish first. But in case of migration to South Korea, we are also in some kind of conversation about how we could study about the migrant workers' health in South Korea. And... Based on our experience, I would say that uh, there is a serious need to be undertaken about the benefits and losses that incurs to the migrant workers and the country, as I said earlier, account, taking account of all, all kind of cost, time, resources, money, and things like that. And the other issue is how does this labor migration governance interface with the operation of the language institutes that facilitates somehow the migration to, to South Korea. And I think one of them, in, again, in reference to the earlier findings about the suicidal cases or attempts, it's very important to understand why that happens. So I would suggest that maybe we need to also understand, explore the realities and expectations, gaps, how are they linked and how it implicates on these attempts or the cases is, is, is very important. And as we want to do, I think another point that maybe we can focus on is what happens to the lives of those who fail the topic? What happens to, into their lives? As well as what happens after the migrant workers migrate to South Korea? What happens into their life, skills, you know, experience, remittances, and their family situation. I think we have a lot of issues and areas to, to do the research in the future. There is a paucity of studies in some of these, uh, these corridors. I think same applies in the case of Israel as well, and the newer de destinations in two European countries that we have experienced increasing number of uh, Nepalese going in the recent years. Excellent. And finally, do you have any messages you'd want to share with our listeners? Also, where can our listeners find your papers? I think I have already maybe shared about our experience, but as I mentioned earlier, the institute that I'm based at, SESLAM, at Social Science Baha, which is located in Ambatish Putali, Kathmandu, is quite heavily invested in academic activities and one of the core areas is to do the research on the issue of labor, mobility, employment. So if you are interested in reading some of the research papers and articles on labor, mobility and employment, you could visit SESLAM or you can also visit the website of Social Science Baha. And I would like to thank all the listeners and your team for having me and giving me the opportunity to share some of the findings of one of the papers. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. Jeevan, thank you so much once again for providing us with the time and your wonderful insights. It was really appreciated. Thank you. And to our listeners, goodbye. We'll see you next time for another episode of Pods by PEI.
Thanks for listening to Pods by PI. I hope you enjoyed Anuj's conversation with Jivan on unveiling Korea, the truth behind access and affordability of Nepali workers. Today's episode was produced by Nirjan Rai with support from Ridesh Sapkota, Khushi Hang, and Sonia Jimmy. The episode was edited by Ridesh Sapkota. Our theme music is courtesy of Rohit Shakya from Zindabad. If you liked today's episode, please subscribe to our podcast. Also, please do us a favor by sharing us on social media and leaving a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to Pods by PI. For PI's video-related content, please search for Policy Entrepreneurs on YouTube. To catch the latest from us on Nepal's policy and politics, please follow us on Twitter at tweet to pi that's tweet, followed by the number 2 and PI, and on Facebook at Policy Entrepreneurs Inc. You can also visit pi.center to learn more about us. Thanks once again from me, Shriya. We'll see you soon in our next episode.